Well, hello, y'all. You never know what to say on the day after Christmas. It's still, do you still say Merry Christmas, or do you, do you still do that? Somebody told me today it was Boxing Day. Anybody ever heard of Boxing Day? Okay, well, I think that's a dumb tradition, so I'm just going to go ahead and just say it right now. So there's actually, some of y'all are disappointed that you didn't get a present yesterday. Don't worry, it's still Boxing Day. You might get a present today. Be, wait, wait until you're, and be disappointed tomorrow. Hey, we, this never happens. This never has happened in the history of this church have the ushers made a mistake. But tonight, they may have given you the wrong bulletin. So if you look at it, and it has next week's date on it, raise your hand, we'll get you this week's. You may have the right one. Those of you that have the wrong one, we just want to straighten that out. It's not any big deal for the teaching notes because uh, it's blank on both, time, both weeks. Um, being the holiday weeks, the office is closed this coming week. That's why we went ahead and did both bulletins um, in advance. But that means that um, we grabbed some of them with the wrong date. Anybody else? I thought I saw a hand up here. Somebody got the wrong one? Yeah, of course, Don, of course. <laughs> right? <laughs> We've been uh, in a series called Presence, working our way through uh, some teachings about worship and in a very um, kind of prolonged way through the Christmas holiday season since before Thanksgiving, we've been studying different passages that kind of gave us insight into what worship might be for us, how we might be instructed in terms of moving forward in it. And so we want to wrap up that series today with y'all and um, take a look at one of the great passages in the scriptures um, for worship where we get to go right straight into the throne room of heaven and see what's going on there. And um, it's really a cool thing and it allows us to kind of see some things that are going on, but it also, um, it kind of gives us some insight into the way that worship is generated. And many times we think that worship comes from this feeling that kind of overwhelms us and then moves us to worship in a certain way. And I hope to show you tonight that worship is actually centered first in what we know, and it moves in then to what we feel. So let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into Revelation chapter 4. If you want to start turning that way, it's the last book all the way to the right, chapter 4. God, thanks for the privilege of being able to meet tonight as we walk into this great scene of seeing what was going on in heaven. God, may you show us some things that we can know about you. And in that process, Father, as we know more, may we worship you more deeply. Will you, we create in us, Father, as a community, a worshiping heart, the kind of worship that you seek out that is in spirit and truth. And so thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to meet. Guide our time. Be our teacher. In Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 4. We're going to take a look at the whole chapter tonight. I'm going to read it all to you and just make some comments and then uh, draw some applications for it at the end. I'm reading from the New Living Translation tonight. Then I looked, Revelation 4.1, and I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, oh, by the way, there's going to be a lot of like, it looked like, it sounded like, it seemed like. When you're trying to describe something you've never seen before and you don't have the vocabulary to really see, um, really understand, you'll use lots of different um, vocabulary like that, just like that. So you'll see it. He speaks like a trumpet blast. You can imagine that this is a person who's never heard sound amplified electronically. Never. And suddenly, it was, we would say, it was as loud as a rock concert or something. But anyway, that, you get the point. You'll see it all through here. Come up here and I will show you what, you must, what must happen after this. And instantly, I was in the spirit and I saw the, a throne in heaven and someone sitting on the throne. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like jasper and carnelian and the glow of of an emerald circle, um, the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Now, what's happening is, is that John, the author of uh, Revelation, is being given a special treat and taken up in the spirit, whatever that might mean, um, into this vision of what's going to happen in the future. 
And there's all kinds of things that he sees. And, and when he begins to describe it, he says, the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones. There's another one. He's, he's trying to figure out, what would we, how would you describe someone whose radiant light is coming out of it in these brilliant colors? Well, the only thing he has that has brilliant colors would be like the, the gemstones that are familiar to him. And so he begins to say, like Jasper and Cornelia. Now, that's interesting because that's the first and the last of the gemstones on the breastplate of the priest whenever he came out on the holy holidays, on the festivals of their Jewish calendar. And it's representing some of the things that he has seen in worship in his, in his own experience. And he says he, said, he saw someone coming out that had that thing. And then a, 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 the glow of an emerald circled around the throne like a rainbow. Now, this is interesting, too, because there's going to be a storm in Revelation. There's going to be all kinds of crazy things going on in this book. But the rainbow always represents something positive when it's, taught, when it's attributed to the Scriptures. It's a promise of hope, a promise of protection. And the rainbow shows up in this instance before the storm. And it says it's like a rainbow, so it was, it was shades of green going around this throne where God is seated. And it says 24 Thrones surrounded him, and 24 elders sat on them. And there's a lot of discussion about who this might be. And I can't begin to tell you who it, who it is. I can tell you I don't believe it's to be it's angels. Um, nowhere else in the scriptures is, is the word elder used for angels. So these 24 folks, I don't believe they're angels. I believe that they are um, people that, are, that have been resurrected, that are now in heaven with God. And it could be that 12 of them represent the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 represent the life of the church. I have no idea really who they are, but they got good seats. 24 elders sat on them, and they were clothed in white and had gold crowns on their head. Interestingly, the crowns is the word used for a crown there that's given to a victor in a race, not the crown that a king holds. Okay, so it's a different word in the Greek, and the word that's used here is the, is the word for a crown that's given to a victor in a race. It's interesting, you know, we, we struggle a little bit with the teachings of the New Testament, those of us who are believers here. We know that we're going to get rewarded, and part of that reward involves crowns. But it's not a crown as if we're given elevation um, and rule. It's a crown of, of well done. It's a crown of running your race well. And um, so we see these, and later on they're going to do something with those crowns. They were all clothed. Okay, from the, from, from the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And every time that lightning and thunder show up in this book, it's, it's like majestic and, and holy. How many, how many have been, we don't have a whole lot of thunder here, which is a strange thing. One of the things that Dana and I miss is thunderstorms. If you've ever lived in the South, you... You know them, but how many have been right in the middle of a thunderstorm where you can actually hear thunder start to crack before it cracks? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, those of you that don't know, sorry. It's just like, it's, it's like a, you can hear it. Be, that was pretty poor. Um, but you can imagine you're around this and it's the, the, there's something in the air that is so powerful and so... Um, ready and charged that there's actually rumblings and lightning flashing all around this throne. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames, and this is the sevenfold Spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. So now you can imagine there's these brilliant colors, all of the colors that you can ever imagine, all across, and green, shades of green all around it, and then lightning kind of flashing through and magnifying those, those colors and how they're coming. And then the ground is like a sea of crystal. It's clear and, and shining, and everything that happens up here is reflected off of the ground, and so that it's magnified at your feet. The things that you see as if they weren't brilliant enough, they're actually being magnified at your feet as well. And in the center and around the throne were four living beings, and I believe these to be angels, each covered with eyes, in front and in back. The first of these living beings was like a lion, and the second was like an ox. third was like a human face and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Now, this is really common in the book of Revelation. You've got these different things that are an angel that's like an ox and an angel that's like an eagle and, and these, these beasts and things that are going on. And so I've tried to read and read and read trying to figure out who, what is this? I mean, and, and nobody really knows for sure. Um, some people thought 
that maybe it represented the entirety of God's creation. You've got wild beasts in the lion. You've got domestic beasts in the ox. You've got the, the humans with the face, a face like a human. And then you've got the birds that fly. But then, of course, you're asking, well, where are the fish? So, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's one thing that could be happening. I like this. I found one commentary, and it said, it, it said that, um, let's see, let me find it. Each creature also seems to possess different qualities that are appropriate for the service of God. Lions are strong. Ox are servants. Men are intelligent. Some men. And eagles are swift. And so maybe, maybe the, uh, the four creatures represent the different, the different services and all that's represented in the service of God. Maybe it's kind of saying all that God has ever created and everything that ever could serve him. Maybe it's the entirety of all creation. Animals, uh, some people ask me about animals in heaven. They are clearly there. And so the animals are involved in that worship and as well as, as uh, human beings and all of this kind of thing. Or maybe it's, maybe it's representing different qualities of God's creation. The truth is, I don't know. But it's, it's representing something to show the breadth and that there's nothing that's exempt from this great worship that's going on in this place. So said, each of the living beings had six wings. With their wings, they covered over, uh, all over with their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out, and day and night, and night after night, day after, sorry, I'm like, Mark, I can't read tonight either. So day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Hopefully that sounds familiar to you because we just sang about um, some of this right there. And, and we see diff two different times in the scriptures we're given privy or recorded down for us people that have been ushered into the throne room of God. And what they saw there both times is a little bit different. One was, remember Ryan when he spoke several weeks ago and he brought, he brought Isaiah 6 to us and he talked about the train and the smoke filling the, the room. And, but there was also something that's in common with Revelation 4. Do you remember what it was? It's the song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, I, and, and that's why I thought there's some things there that you can begin to kind of grasp and, and begin to see this day after day and night after night that worship begins in this way with the things that we think. As they describe, they're not describing, God, you're mysterious and there's nothing we can know about you. They're saying, we know some things about you. We know that you're holy, that you're omnipotent, that you're powerful, that you're eternal. The, the one who was, always was, who is, and who's still to come. God, that these kinds of things, and then whenever the living beings, it goes on to say, whenever the living beings give glory and honor, they give thanks to the one sitting on the throne like the one who lives forever and ever. And the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the, the throne and say, see, there's the opportunity. You've, we get these rewards, but these rewards are things that we've done here on earth. And then we place them in, in worship. We give, they give us an opportunity to respond back to the God that we see in heaven, who we recognize and see, wow, this guy is holy and other than us. For you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And they exist because you created what you pleased. And you just see this scene and it's, and it's amazing to think about. Imagine if you were put into a place where you were asked to describe for people um, something you've never seen before. And how words would begin to fail you. I'm sure that there were later when John would have this read and they would talk, John, tell us more. And he said, well, it was kind of like a ruby, but rubies really don't, you know, it just really didn't, it was redder than that. You know what I mean? And so he begins to talk about the things that he knew. Now I want to I draw some applications in terms of what goes on here and what we see happening in this passage. And kind of start to apply it and, and share some quotes with you. And I, actually, I want to try to push you mentally in terms of what you think about God. The first thing that I noticed when I was going through this passage, and I, this, I just want to do this in passing because it was more of a personal application for me, but I want to share it with you. The verses, all chapter 4, all started out with verse 1. I looked and I saw a door standing open. 
You know, I guess heaven could have been represented in so many different ways. A gate with guards around that opened up for them. There could have been a giant double door or anything. But when heaven is seen, it's an open door. And I just thought, as we go into this whole thing that I'm about to talk about, I just want to say first that heaven is open to all who would like to enter in. God is not an arbitrary God up in heaven that is sending some people to heaven and sending some people to hell. That is unscriptural, men and women. That is not what God is doing. God is honoring the choice that you and I make. And those who desire to be with him, he and, and they do that through faith in Jesus Christ, he rewards them with that. And those who choose to be apart from him, how loving would it be if you said, I don't want anything to do with you, and yet God said, well, I'm still going to make you be with me for eternity. How loving is that? He's going to say simply, okay, I'll give you what you choose. I'll honor what you want. The door of heaven is seen as open. And if there's anybody here who is yet to embrace the reality of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, I would plead with you. I would plead with you to embrace what Jesus has done on the cross, dying for our sins that separated us from a holy, holy, holy God. God invaded time and space and he came as a child so that he could take on flesh because no one was going to be able to be good enough to get to him on their own. And so the gospel, the good news is, is that God loved us enough to invade time and space history to be able to show us just how much he loved. And heaven stands open for you if you only believe in the work of Christ and place your trust in his payment for your sins. Now, then this worship that I see going on here is not something that's based on some ooey-gooey emotional response. When I hear them speaking about, of their worship, they're speaking of things that they know. Did you notice that? They're, they're not saying, oh God, I feel good when I'm with you. I, they're saying, God, this is who you are, and when we see who you are, we worship you fully. And sometimes as Christians, we get a little bit lazy about what we tend to know, and we allow some things to kind of scare us out of it. Let me read you something from a book by Dallas Willard called Knowing Christ Today. He goes on to say, though the task of this book is to deal at length with main points involved in this in general secularist outlook, let us say immediately that the developments of the modern thought have not shown the substance of Christian thinking and Christian teaching to be false, false or groundless. There have been many discoveries to be sure, but none producing that result or even close. Modern discoveries, therefore, have not shown that Christianity's central teachings do not or cannot form a body of knowledge accessible to capable and responsible inquirers. In, in, in spite of what you hear and in spite of what the press might tell you, there have been no discoveries. There is nothing in modern thought that has proven that the body of knowledge that we have as Christians is unreliable. Let me share you one more quote. It is one of the curiosities of the Western intellectual history that during the last century or so, those with, listen, listen, those with no serious involvement with practical Christianity may be totally ignorant of it or even hostile to it, have been allowed under the guise of scholarship or innovative thought to define what religion is and to reinterpret Christian teachings in light of their own biased definitions and purposes. It is a curiosity, he says, that we have allowed people who do not even claim to follow the teachings of Christ to stand from afar and criticize us in such a way that we have now shrunken back and say, well, we just, you know, it's faith, it's faith, we can't really know. Now, I agree, we are people of faith, but there are some things that we can know. And it's important what you know. I'm reading from a book, about 50-year-old book called Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. I've referenced it many times. Um, it is a fantastic little skinny book. 
that'll take you your lifetime to digest. Listen to this. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. See, we have, we have somehow relegated back and retreated back to this point, and we've made worship this, this totally emotional response that's just an act of simple faith that cannot be known. And when I see worship happening in heaven, it is based on things they know, based on things that have been recorded that we can, in fact, know. That God is holy, that he is eternal, that he is omniscient and omnipotent. Let me stretch you with a couple of those words. Let me just talk to you a little bit about how God is all-knowing or omniscient. Listen to this. God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and all matters, all mind and every mind, all spirit and all spirits, all being and every being, all creaturehood and all creatures, every plurality and all pluralities, all law and every law, all relations, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feelings, all desires, all unuttered secrets, all thrones and dominions, all personalities, all things visible and invisible in heaven and in earth, motion, space, time, life, death, good, evil, heaven, and hell. God, God knows all of those things effortlessly. It is not difficult for him to keep those things all straight. He knows what you did today. He knows what you might have done today and the billions of opportunities and possibilities that have come out through those choices that you didn't even make. And he is completely aware right now of everything going on. Everything you're thinking right now. When we say that God is all-knowing and he is omniscient, when we say that we can take confidence in the fact that God knows all things and can work all things for our good, it is something that we can know based on his character. How about his holiness? We sing of his holiness and those kinds of things. Listen to this. Where was it? We know nothing like divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power and admire his wisdom, but his holiness he can only imagine. And then another quote. Holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. And so in this effort, you think, well, gosh, God is so much bigger, so much beyond anything I could ever know. How could I ever even begin to attain that? And you would say, well, it's kind of like a small child. I remember this illustration once. A small child trying to reach a star, and in the child's foolishness, he saw the star and thought he could reach it and thought he could get to it. When, the, Of course, as an adult, you're standing there going, you silly kid, you'll never reach that star. And that is true. But somehow in the stars, in the child's effort to reach to the star, he drew attention to that star and had every adult in the room looking at whatever in the world it was that that silly kid was trying to reach. Our minds cannot begin to grasp what it would mean to know everything. Our mind cannot begin to grasp what it means to be holy as God is holy. But as we reach toward it, as we begin to wrap our heads around some of the teachings of what that might mean, it draws our attention to it and it draws others' attention to it while we reach. Does that make sense? 
So worship begins and is base or pure based on the thoughts that it starts with. I talk to a lot of guys, and, and guys especially, let's, let's admit this, guys. We're really having a hard time getting into the emotional aspect sometimes of what it means to worship God. And to give ourselves over to that emotion is just so foreign to everything else that we do except when we watch a sporting event that we just can't seem to really do it very well. And I would challenge you with this thought that it doesn't begin actually there. That worship actually begins with what you think of God first. And then moves into your heart. Worship, I say, and this is a quote from, again, from A.W. Tozer in another book called The Missing Jewel of the Evangelical Church. Worship, I say, rises or falls with our concept of God. And if there is one terrible disease in the church of Christ, it is that we do not see God as he really is. That he is sovereign that he is holy, that he is omniscient and omnipotent, just and merciful. If you worked your way through this, actually, I, one commentary said, in this chapter you see God is perfectly holy, just, grac- gracious, righteous, pure, omnipotent, eternal, and sovereign. Now, in the midst of that, when you begin to wrap your head around some of those concepts and realize how great God is, it moves and should stir emotional response that is many times reflected in an outpouring of worship that is known, maybe we would sing, maybe we would pray out loud, maybe our posture would reflect it. Certainly in this chapter we see that the worship of what they know moves them to a posture of kneeling and falling down and laying crowns at feet and singing together. But this is really hard for us to be able to do this part especially because we've come from so many different backgrounds. Worship right here gets a little bit tweaked. And so we found a tutorial video that will finally clear up for you what you can do and how you can express the worship that you need to, you sometimes feel and are so confused and so bottled up. So let me show you this video and it will finally put to rest all of the confusion that you've had in your past. What starts to beget, beget, begin to get difficult is that in the expression of our worship, all of us come with different kinds of pasts and different kinds of comfortability with this. And so the reality is, is that there is no right way and no wrong way. You would know, though, that you're on the wrong track whenever you're expressing some kind of a worship and you're wondering how others are taking it around you. So if you have any kinds of thoughts if, of anyone around you in that, well, then now your worship is no longer directed towards Christ and is now directed towards, I wonder what people are thinking. Or if you say, if I did this, I would look really godly. You can know for sure that that is not a spirit-led response inside of your heart. I have had both of those things happen in my own life. I come from the South, and in the South, when I first became a Christian, the only churches that really raised their hands were ones that we disagreed with theologically. And it was quite a heated disagreement back when I first became a believer in the 80s and when I was first going to church in the 80s. I was instructed in this really well, and I've shared this story with the church before. When I went to a training video or a training uh, exercise as a chaplain for the San Jose PD, and in this training exercise there was, was an interactive video plus combatants that you would be thrown into this situation and then you would wa- everybody would be watching you and you would have to go in and bring the situation under control um, as you went in. And then as you did that, they would coach you and, and correct you for what you didn't do or what you should have done. Like if you went in there and somebody said something and you just shot the screen with the little pellet gun thing, they would say, well, you know, you might want to wait before you shoot. 
But one thing that they said over and over and over again was, as a police officer, you need to make sure that everyone's actions are subservient to your demands. You need to know and understand that everything that is going on out there is not going to be anything that surprises you and that you're in control. And if they make a move and you're not aware of it, it could cost you your life. And so there was one phrase they used over and over and over and over. As every single person went in there, they would coach them over and over. Use this phrase. And the phrase was, show me your hands. Put your hands where I can see them. Show me your hands. And immediately for me, it was like, when I worship, I am saying, when I sh I'm showing you my hands. And I don't think of God as a cop. Think of, but work with me here. It works for me. I am saying, you're in control, and I am not. Your will not my own, your direction, not mine. I don't want to do anything that's outside of what you want me to do. I don't want to move in any way that moves me away from something that you want me to be or something that you want me to hear and something that you want me to do. I show you my hands. And I, that phrase has never left me. Now, I'm not, this is not a sermon about trying to get you to raise your hands. It is a sermon that is trying to help you realize that once you know and think rightly about God, your posture should follow with heartfelt response. Worship means to feel in the heart. Worship also means to express in a some appropriate manner what you feel. Now, I'm not, I don't want to define what's appropriate for you. What I do want you to do, though, is to have the freedom to be able to respond. Now, I know our room doesn't allow for that a lot. I mean, it's difficult to kneel here, although you certainly can, and we would welcome that if you wanted to. It's difficult to dance in the aisle there where you're seated, and we would, if you want to dance, we would allow that and say, if you might want to go to the back to do it, just so that you don't draw any undue attention to you. If you get up here and start dancing and people are drawn to you instead of the worship, then as a shepherd, I've got to step into that and say, I don't want the attention drawn to you. What we're doing here is to draw attention to God the Father and Jesus' Son. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is doing that. If you want to dance, dance your heart out right back there 30 yards back. 20 yards back. Okay? But my, my, the idea is, is that our posture would reflect the reality of our heart. And that you would be free to check that out. When I told you I was raised in the South and I didn't go to church until I was 23 and I, it took me a long time to get my hands above my shoulders. Everything was like right in here where there could never be a holding penalty called on me. I would never put my hands out here anywhere. I was like right in here. Usually it was only one. Right here. And as I grew... And my ideas and thoughts of God came about. Finally, it, it began to dawn on me that I show you my hands. The other, the other thing about this is just, when we do this in our culture a lot. If you go to a sporting event, whatever your sport is, and you see something happen really good, you're going to look around and people are going to be doing this. It's a natural response of adoration for what's happened. And I would encourage you to consider that. If that's where your heart moves you to. Some of you guys will never raise your hands and that's, there's not a right or wrong. So please don't misunderstand. The worship that we want to be able to offer to God is both in spirit and in truth. Isn't that amazing? That, that in the Gospel of John, he would say, this is the kind of worship the Father seeks out. Spirit, heartfelt, and truth, head. Not just one or the other, but a both that serves us really well. I pray as a community we'll grow in the ability to respond to the otherness, the, the amazing holiness of God, the eternal Father that knows all and can do all. And as we think rightly on him, we will worship him 
and show him our hands. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the the little picture of heaven that John shares with us. Thank you for the opportunity for us to follow in that example. We acknowledge that you are beyond our ability to comprehend. You are beyond our understanding. And yet, God, we can know and know with confidence that you are good and that you are great. And you are deserving of our worship. We bring it to you now. We lay it at your feet. We sing that you're not only beautiful, but holy. And we bow before you in Jesus' name.